Uh, my name is Ulva Erlingsson. Uh, I'm in infrastructure security here at Google, and uh, this is the second Authors at Google talk I host about banking. Uh, now, my interest there is probably primarily that I'm from Iceland originally, and uh, three of the six largest bankruptcies in history are Icelandic banks, uh, and that happened like in 2008, so it's relatively recent. Now, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Anat Almari from uh, the Stanford Business School, she's, where she's a professor of finance and economics. And uh, she's going to tell us uh, about sort of the main reason why those Icelandic banks failed. And the main reason is still around, it hasn't been fixed uh, in any way. And it's also explained in her book, uh, The Banker's New Clothes, which uh, Nadine from uh, Books Incorporated is selling here for five bucks. So it's a pretty good price. Uh, anyway, so uh, with that, I'll leave the floor to Anat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I dropped the uh, banker's new clothes from this title. This is the subtitle of the book, What's Wrong with Banking and What to Do About It, because the banker's new clothes is about exposing all the nonsense. But if we started there, we would never quite finish, because there is a lot of it. Uh, and I'll hint at that uh, at some point later on, why we're here, why all this obvious stuff I'm saying is not understood. Because uh, People don't want you to understand it, basically. Uh, or maybe they don't understand it themselves. I can't quite ever tell. So uh, anyway, let's start with, uh, so this is going to start very serious. We're hitting right there, as opposed to you know how I came to even be here and explain these things um, to anybody who'd listen. Uh, what's wrong with banking? Well, so let me start with a diagnosis. What's wrong with banking? Well, there's a whole long list here. What's wrong with banking uh, is a very, very fragile system, highly interconnected, lots of risks that's entirely unnecessary in this system, and lots of distortions to the whole economy, meaning things just inefficient. Lots of governance problems. Governance problems are basic problems where somebody makes a decision and the other person is impacted, doesn't have control over it. That's a basic governance problem. And because this is a system that doesn't work if you leave it alone, it requires good regulation. And part of the problem with it is it's not regulated effectively to make it better, to help it from itself, basically, or from the people in it. And as a result of that, it doesn't support the economy. It's a part of the infrastructure, you could say, of the economy that's just not working very well. Um, what makes it so fragile? Well, the first thing, and the one of that I'm going to talk about it a lot, is that there's just a lot of reliance on debt in this system, just a lot of borrowing. The way banks and many, many institutions fund what they do is borrow money, make promises to pay later, and not just any money. They promise to depositors that they can get their money anytime. They promise uh, overnight creditors that they can get their money tomorrow. They promise lots of people, and there's no, not enough ability in the system to absorb the losses should they happen. So, and then it's all interconnected. In other words, I owe you, and you owe somebody else, but that somebody else might owe me, and so it's all, all very interconnected. And the regulation has enormous flaws in it. The way it's structured, the way it's measured, uh, the way they can get around it, all of those things uh, make this regulation basically incredibly ineffective. Uh, so here is sort of a system for you. Uh, the system has this, they'll call it the shadow banking. There are lots of institutions outside other institutions and they're connected with it in num numerous ways. If you kind of step back from it and there's somebody putting money in the bank and somebody borrowing money somewhere and we have intermediation in between them, somehow there's no numerous layers there and I think that in the talk about Iceland you saw how interconnected systems can get with sort of self-dealing and self ownership and who, you know, lending to yourself and all that. The question for society, of course, is going to be, is there value generated in every one of these places that somehow has a reason for existing in this world? Somebody wanted to create this institution outside the balance sheet of this bank or outside somewhere else and interacting in another layer uh, with the rest of the system. Are we sure that's a good thing to have such a complicated system? Uh, so the, when the system gets to be like this and very fragile, you get these contagion effects, these dominoes, and, uh, and all of that. 
And so uh, you touch something and the whole system can crumble. What does it mean, touch it? In 2008, what touched it, or 2007 it started, what touched it was a decline, and a bubble burst in housing in the US. In the grand scheme of things, not a big thing. There were a lot of bad loans made. Some borrowers defaulted. It was not an amount of money that should take down the global economy. And yet, the system was so fragile, it couldn't withstand that. A bankruptcy of one institution like Lehman Brothers just sent this whole thing uh, to implosion. Well, what are we going to do about it? Well, there are proposals all over the place. Uh, one of them is about you know, the failure. So the bankruptcy doesn't work. Let's find a better way to fail them. So if they can't pay their debts, they'll fail, like other people. The problem with that is they're very global. I'll show you an interconnected map across the world. And they live globally but die locally. So to die, if you have 2,000 subsidiaries, each one of these has to go out into a bankruptcy procedure depending on the law in that country. And that's a mess. And that's what happened with Lehman. This bankruptcy, 80 different bankruptcy processes or more started all over the world. And it took years. It's still barely done since then. And meanwhile, it freezes everything and all of that. Banks can't kind of go through that. So no matter how I'm involved in the effort, it's part of the reform to have the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, take down a JP Morgan. Good luck to all of us if that happens. These banks are much bigger than Lehman was. Uh, and good luck to us if we should go into that. So that's not a great solution. The other is let's make sure that we kind of make them smaller and somehow restrict what they can do. The problem with that, so we have various, you might hear these words, Volcker rule, you can't do this and you can do that and all of that. And these are potentially, when you talk about Glass-Steagall, I can't go into all of that. I'll be happy to talk a little bit about it. We used to have a separation between investment banks and commercial banks, deposit-taking institutions. If you take deposits, you can only do this and not that. That's a tough subject. The problem is it might help, but if they remain fragile and there's more layers and more different little institutions, they can still be failing at the same time or causing each other to fail together. So you might not get rid of that fragility of this system by some kind of structural uh, reform of who can do what. So you're not going to the heart of the problem, to the heart of that fragility. And you could say, you know, I'm not going to bail them out. I hate bailouts. You know, there, was, there were a lot of bailouts, um, meaning creditors got paid when the bank couldn't, AIG, City, Bear Stearns, many other banks. Or the government just invested in them so they could pay their debts. Trouble Desert Relief Program, other things. Uh, the problem with trying to say, you know, I wrote in the law that I won't bail you out is that if the time comes and it's better to bail them out than not, then you'll have an emergency law. And it's hard for governments to commit to that. They probably even shouldn't commit. They should do what's best. But it's kind of a hostage situation. In other words, you, you can't quite uh, commit to what you'd like to commit. Here is a, a network for you, just the width of the line. This is just I picked up yesterday, so I don't show you the uh, same diagram as Iceland. But this is across the globe for sure, 20 countries, and how the flows of money is between them. And these are financial institutions. The thickness of the line is just how much there is. In other words, the system is knotted up together in a big, in sort of impossible to end disentangle knot. So uh, are we stuck with this system? Is it the best we can do? If we want to have a financial system, a global financial system, where you know, we have a global trade and the banks are all over, are we stuck? We're not. I want you to keep in mind two analogies just for understanding what I'm about to say. One is that banks' behavior displays a form of addiction to certain harmful things, harm to others in this case, or even to the banks themselves when you look at their entire set of investors, including depositors. Uh, but they can't 
commit not, not to doing it because it's too tempting to do. And uh, we have inadvertently policies that encourage them to do those polluting things. And then they do. We have to push back so they don't. Analogy number two is a speeding truck. You could think of what I'm about to describe to you, for example, the excessive way, excessive amount of borrowing by banks as, uh, as a way of speeding. It kind of gets you there fast if you're lucky, but you're also taking a lot of risk of blowing up. In this particular case, uh, if you embellish this narrative or this analogy, the trucks uh, have subsidized insurance and their drivers get out before the implosion. They're okay, but the collateral damage is uh, made, but they will say, let me get back in the truck and drive again. That's my natural speed. That's the kind of uh, banker's new clothes. The question will ask about an ounce of prevention. Can we put a speed limit? Can we just stop that speed? So what am I talking about? I'm talking about putting uh, more equity in place instead of their funding themselves with a lot of debt. So the big concept, it's an accounting concept, so it's very scary sometimes, but it's a very simple concept, is a concept of a balance sheet. A balance sheet has two sides. One side is what the investments are, and the other side is how it's funded, basically. There's borrowed money, debt, liabilities, and there is the rest, which is the down payment on a house, Shareholder equity, owner's money, equity. Well, magically, if you fund your investments with more equity, you're more resilient to downside. Homeowners saw that, companies see this all the time. So if, should there be the uh, Pac-Man that comes and eats some of your profits, uh, look at the bank that uh, people are wondering if it's still gonna be able to pay its debt. Is it solvent? or not. And look at the bank with more equity, still around, because the debt's still in place, and it's the equity that absorbs the losses, and also that makes the gain. That's the fun part of it, uh, when it works out, because then they pay the debt and take all the upside. That's the leverage, that's the effect of borrowing that magnifies the upside. And the downside, should there be another loss, uh-oh, the bank could become insolvent, underwater, like homeowners that, whose house is worth less than they owe. And now all kinds of terrible things are gonna happen. The government can bail them out, uh, but in the case of banks, there'll be all kinds of disruptions to the system because people may have run away from them when they were afraid, uh, all kinds of other things. They stopped lending because they had to sell their assets, all kinds of the mechanisms that we saw. Uh, those of you who kind of were paying attention in 2008, or if you weren't, your parents were. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, the question is why wouldn't we have a more resilient banking system? Let's look at a bank, our biggest bank, J.P. Morgan Chase. If you look at the balance sheet of J.P. Morgan Chase, it has on one side all kinds of assets. They want you to think that they are lending and that's their job. They're lending to the real economy. God forbid, don't touch their loans. But in fact, lending is only a very small part of what they do. Say J.P. Morgan Chase defines in their assets, the IOUs of all their borrowers, their loans, is part of their assets, $700 billion. The bank then has all kinds of assets, you know, derivatives in London, all kinds of other things, physical commodities, uh, you name it these days. You will be amazed what they have, lots and lots of things. And um, a little bit of cash, that's the assets. And how are they funding this? $1.2 trillion of deposits. This is money they owe. They sometimes forget it's so easy is our money when we give it to them. We don't give it to them like normal creditors. That's the beginning of what's wrong. They love that funding. In short, and we just trust that it's okay. Trust that the regulators to protect us or something. And then they borrow in any number of very creative ways. Overnight against all kinds of collaterals, they call them repos, we can go through that. They find ways to promise, to get somebody to give them money in exchange for a promise, to pay back. 
and very little shareholder money, equity. That also funds, okay? They have uh, shareholder equity uh, in an area of under $200 billion by shareholder uh, stock price or whatever cap market capitalization. They're not very large. They are smaller than you know, Apple. They are smaller than many other companies. But by asset size, they are the largest. And this is through accounting systems that ignore trillions of dollars of derivatives, just net them out. So they have ways to do the accounting in such a way that we won't even see the actual exposures. And I don't have time to go through that, but the book explains what's off their balance sheet that has risk in it that affects them and everybody around them. So they'll tell you, if you listen to Jamie Dimon, he'll tell you it's a fortress, fortress balance sheet. Not the image you should have not a fortress, extremely fragile and extraordinarily systemic. Too big to fail, incredibly messy. Nobody can understand what's going on there. You can't read their financial statements and understand. You won't understand even the Wells Fargo accounting statements and people have tried. So these are very, very, very complex as corporations. Almost impossible for just about anybody to understand, regulate, control, all of that, and the scandals every day give you a hint of that as well. So how much equity should banks have? Guess what? In the regulation of, uh, of uh, Basel, what's called, this is a, a, a city in Switzerland where they sit around and decide on minimum requirements that 27 countries are supposed to impose on their banks. Uh, the previous regulation coming into the crisis was that they should have 2%, but not 2% of the total investment, but 2% of something called risk-weighted assets. So this is where you can ignore some, some things. Like for example, if a, if a credit rating agency says that it's AAA, then you can just think of it as good as cash, except until it's downgraded and then it's not so good as cash. Or if it's Greek debt in the euro, if you're a German bank or a Greek or a Cyprus bank, you can lend to Greece. Don't have any assumption that it might go down, as good as cash, even if it's paying 20% like junk bonds. The regulation views it as safe because it's a promise by a government, even though the government can't really print those euros like Greece, and Greece defaulted. So they now will tell you that they tripled these requirements, tripled them from two to 7%, and you can go down to four and a half, of risk-weighted assets, which for the Swiss banks is like, the denominator of that percentage is like a sixth of their total assets because there's so many assets that get weight of very, very small weight. And of course, those are the assets they love. If the regulation thinks they're safe, but they're actually risky and pay a lot of return, that's the place to go. And they'll all go there and get more concentration and more interconnectedness and more fragility in this system. So there, I mentioned before the risk weights, one source of fragility, bad regulation. And now, because they saw that the banks were gaming this regulation, this regulation, by the way, Basel II, was not implemented in the US, except, guess what, for the investment banks. The same investment banks that got into the most trouble. It was the deposit institution, because Sheila Baer, who was the head of the FDIC, didn't like those risk weights that they basically kept them from manipulating these risk weights and playing with the models of these risk weights uh, to, uh, to kind of get the equity as low as they could get away with. So now they put in a stop gap measure, 3% in Basel III, the big reform. 3% of total asset has to be sort of equity. Used to also be that they accepted some other things that are, might be equity, might absorb losses under some conditions, and no such capital, what they call, absorbed losses in the crisis. Everybody got paid. Even if you were promised, except in this case, in that case, you were paid. So when the banks were bailed out, all the creditors got paid. Everybody who was promised. These requirements, when I looked at them four years ago when they came out, were based on Nonsense, let me say the word. Bad analysis, okay, of the trade-offs, misunderstandings, whatever. Is it tough? They'll tell you, oh, it tripled the previous requirements. 
Tripling almost nothing doesn't give you very much. So tripling this 2% to risk weighted asset is still like ridiculously low. And in a review of our book, John Cochran said, because we don't come out with precise numbers, because there's so many issues around how you count them and how you what's a denominator and how to deal with risk and all of that. How much the point is you want that balance sheet to absorb most of the losses under normal conditions. You want them to remain safe and to go get more equity when they get down into distress. That's what would keep them functioning so they don't harm other, others when they, when they fail. Or they can have a more orderly sort of uh, intervention. So I can list, I could go on and on about the benefits of forcing banks to fund with more equity. Then we can ask ourselves, why is it that they hate it so much, okay? And there'll be reasons for that. From their perspective, it won't be that complicated. Many reasons, strong reasons. If you have more equity, so many things are better. They're less likely to default, they're less likely to get distressed, less likely to have runs. Uh, the downside will be borne by the same people who have the upside and not by the rest of society, not by taxpayers. They won't need bailouts. Uh, when they need to sell assets because they lost a little bit, they won't have to sell such a big fraction of their assets. If you have equity at 2% and you lose a tiny bit, that's you to recover and be have back to 2%, you have to sell an enormous amount of assets. So, you know, because you lost half of your equity suddenly. Uh, so your entire being, you're not living on the edge as much. The subsidies that are associated with being too big to fail, which means that those who nobody believes will fail, get creditors to give them money under cheaper terms, which is completely established and they still deny it, but it's completely true, and don't write as many conditions and all of that. So the ease with which a bank like that can borrow, just like Fannie and Freddie could, uh, with the backing of the government, uh, would be reduced. In other words, you will prevent them from, you, from in, in increasing that subsidy to, to the stratosphere, which is basically the, the worst kind of subsidies we can give. We want to reduce them. Um, and everything that the banks do is distorted by being so incredibly indebted, because heavily indebted borrowers are just not making good decisions usually. They tend to love risk. They tend to underinvest. Homeowners that don't have a lot of equity in the house don't invest in maintenance. That's why the foreclosures find houses that are wrecked. Uh, they won't put in. Uh, they won't give a gift to the creditor if they think they might walk away. Similarly, companies that are distressed are going to underinvest. Countries that are overindebted underinvest because there need to be enough upside to justify the investment. Otherwise, it's a gift to the creditor. And so the dynamics of overhangs is very intense. And risk is good. If you're underwater, you're gambling with other person's money, and it's gambling for resurrection. The downside is just as bad, and the upside, uh, you, are, uh, you might be alive. So there's reason to take the company and put it on the roulette uh, if there's nothing to lose. So the borrower is playing with the creditor's money, basically, and only can win from the upside, and otherwise the creditor loses. So the history of banking doesn't have as much indebtedness as banks have today, uh, which is always in the single digit amount of equity, however you measure it. History of banking, if you go back to 19th century before they had so much support, so many safety nets, is when there were partnerships, the partners had unlimited liability, they had to cover the losses, and they had 50% of the investment of the bank funded by equity and 50% by deposits. So depositors needed the bank owners to be there, or they wouldn't trust the bank. Then as banks became corporations with limited liability, meaning the owners can, of the upside or of a share can walk away, uh, they grew. And they, uh, as you put in, central banks that give them you know, support against collateral, uh, and you put deposit insurance in place so depositors didn't worry about anything anymore. Uh, the more safety nets you put in place, the more they loved and were able to rely on borrowed money to fund their investment, and the more they resisted putting their own money at risk. Why is that? It was related to, uh, to that uh, safety net. 
and to an effect that is called like a leverage ratchet. It's a sort of addiction to boring that is always there. A borrower always becomes a bit addicted to borrowing, will take another loan as long as the creditor doesn't scream as long as it viol doesn't violate the contract that they have. By industry, I'll just summarize this figure for you. Uh, you'll find Google and Apple and all these high-tech companies at the place where they just don't use any debt. This is debt to total. is basically depends on the industry, and there's we won't go into that. I teach corporate finance, and we talk about why you might borrow more or less, but uh, we have theories about that. And no industry and no borrowers in the economy without any regulation has as little equity on a regular basis. No healthy industry lives like that. And there's plenty of equity to go around. Most companies use their retained earnings as a first source of funding, and retained earnings are attributable to equity. It's onboard money. So if you're Warren Buffett, you never pay out. You just keep investing. If they want a dividend, they can sell some shares. If you have good investments to do, you don't need to pay out. Here are the facts. Banks will tell you they're so special. They make long-term risky investments. They're not special in that. Every company makes illiquid long-term investments, very risky, often riskier than making a loan. Making a loan is not that risky. You diversify a little bit over the credit risk. You know, there is some risk, but you know, it's not more than other industries or companies take. It's just the way it's funded that makes it so dangerous. Um, Set on average, by market value, companies have 70% equity. At least ones that have ac access to, to, to markets, for sure. And most healthy corporations uh, and non-banks, without any regulation, just don't borrow that much. If they did, they, they'll start having covenants, they'll start having all kinds of things, even though they'll get a tax advantage from borrowing. Everybody does, corporations. Yet, we don't see such levels of borrowing with no regulation. But the banks love to borrow, love to borrow. Even when they have under 10% equity, they pay dividends, borrow some more. That's banks. Why do they love to borrow so much? Well, the short answer is works for them. Works for them on their bonuses. Works for them on the ease with, it, with which they can borrow. Works for them to. Uh, Get the upside while putting the downside on somebody else. Works for them. And they can. So why do they love to borrow? Because it works for them and they're able to. Which is not the same for, uh, for other people, at least not as much. So there is a levered ratchet effect which affects all borrowing. Once that is in place, the same reason or incentive for a heavy borrower to take a little bit more risk, which the downside of which is shared by the creditor, at least if they can walk away from the debt, uh, means that once you borrow, you want to borrow more. So it becomes a bit addictive. Usually, creditors will know this and will put in all kinds of terms in the contract to prevent that, because they know that their borrower is playing with their money and will be tempted to take another loan on top of them or equal seniority. But even if they take a second mortgage, they're more likely to default, which harms the first lender. So the Creditors always have to worry, but bank banks are able to get people to lend to them. For example, depositors. Depositors come in, don't worry about anything. We put money in the bank, the bank goes in place, takes the upside, and uh, then. Compensation in banking often depends on something called return on equity. Uh, it's a whole culture thing, and they always say that this is their job to produce returns. Well, basic corporate finance says just taking risk by itself, anybody can do. Why would I pay you the big bucks just to do that? Uh, anybody can take risk and get appropriate return in these markets. So the notion that your job is to produce returns, well, do you produce more returns than is reasonable for the risk you take? That's the question. So producing returns is not even an objective, let alone makes any sense as an objective if you don't adjust for risk. The more leverage, the more risk for the equity, because it's leveraged. So all this kind of focus on taking risk, basically being paid to gamble, gives bankers an incentive to say, I got to borrow this much. This, if you don't let me, terrible things will happen. That kind of thing. So the scale is tipped for the bankers in favor of borrowing. 
put the deposits in place that we all need for payment system, but now the extra dollar that they fund, where would they want to take it from that? Never from retained earnings or equity or not very much. Uh, but all these reasons why they like to basically mean that it's cheaper for them on account of somebody else bearing the cost. They save, but somebody else is paying. It's a whole, there's nothing about it that comes out of nowhere. There's no magic to it. For society, uh, what would be, or what would be uh, much better is if they uh, fund with much more equity. So here's another visual for you. The bank can fund loans. Suppose we wanted the loans that they fund. So you could imagine a company producing just about anything. And they need to get the money. Well, they can get the money from debt or from equity. Now, the more debt that they use, the more they pollute the rest of the economy. So think of an excessive indebtedness as a pollutant for the system because it introduces all these fragilities. If you can pay, that it cascades through and all of that. Now, what do we do? We have policies in place that subsidize and encourage and enable more and make the debt more attractive to the banks. They respond by using a lot of debt and just a little bit of equity, and therefore pollute more. So in other words, we have a situation in which we can get maybe some cheap product if we subsidize it. Anything that you can subsidize, you can get the price maybe, the subsidies to pass on, maybe. But then we got to clean up the river. So how did we get? The bankers are happy. Do they pass these subsidies? There's actually little evidence that the more they lever, the more the rest of the economy wins. Basically, what happens to lending, in short, is you get too much and too little of it sometimes at the same time. You get them to love risky loans, credit card loans. They send everybody a credit card, 20% interest. And at the same time, they don't want to make the boring business loan that doesn't have enough upside. So. People would complain they don't get loans, but then some other people get too many loans, and they'll price the loans. Making loans is an investment anybody can make. We don't know if they uh, actually pass it on. What we do know is if you look at it carefully, and of course they'll have their own industry-sponsored studies that deny this, there is no evidence that there is economies of scale in banking beyond $100 billion. If you correct for the fact that the, more, the bigger you grow, the more subsidies you actually have, so therefore your profits are based on subsidized funding, once you correct for that, there is no evidence that the largest the bank, the more efficient the bank is in terms of getting product out of the bank, getting work out of the bank. There is evidence that the subsidies, which are enormous, this shows you the, essentially what the banks would have had to pay if they wanted somebody to insure their debt when they were so close to the abyss. In, in, of course, like insurance, like free insurance, it's, it's worth less in good times. And of course, uh, when, you get, uh, when you need it, uh, if you had to buy it, you'd have to pay a lot. So the value of the guarantees that the banks were getting was enormous around the crisis. They would have really gone broke if they didn't, if they didn't have them, many of them. So what do we have? We have a system where we perversely subsidize pollution even though there's sort of a clean alternative funding. Once deposits are in place, you can always add equity. You buy anything with it, but it backs up your liabilities, self-insurance. Uh, and so the more indebtedness, uh, the better their lives are. They produce more average returns, maybe. Uh, they get better compensation. And, uh, and we're drinking the polluted water, basically. Uh, so there's a large cost to society for these implicit guarantees. The thing about implicit guarantees is you don't see them all the time. You think it's free to just say, oh, I'll guarantee your debt. In the book, we have a chapter in which our homeowner borrower, Kate, has an Aunt Claire. This is like, and Aunt Claire says, you buy, buy a house, I'll guarantee your mortgage. She gets a great loan from the bank. The bank doesn't care if she puts a down payment because Aunt Claire is rich. But when Aunt Claire tells Kate that uh, she can go buy, build a corporation and invest in anything and she'll guarantee her debt, Blank guarantees, blanket guarantees. She can go to Las Vegas too. She takes the upside if it doesn't work out. I mean, she pays dividends to herself on the upside. On the downside, she just borrows more until she runs her aunt, of course. And we've seen countries being 
being harmed by this Iceland being one of them, Ireland, another one, Cyprus, another one. That's how bad it can get. For the others, it's still incredibly costly. So the big picture, we want to shuffle the claims. All investors, investments can be done. If banks figuratively have more equity, I don't even care that they grow as long as it's with equity. They won't grow. They will begin to respond more to market signals. Conglomerates in the 80s broke from being bloated and inefficient and started being more streamlined and more nimble. These banks are monstrous, inefficiently monstrous. If they had to fund in market prices and not in subsidized way and would have fewer, less incentives to be so big and complicated in order to be too big to fail, then we might begin to see more efficient institutions uh, being formed for market forces. Right now, the markets are failing to correct all of that. The incentives are all bad. How do you make it work? Well, it's, it's a challenge, but you got to focus on what you need to do. First of all, they have to increase their equity, and they have earnings. Just the other week, the Fed, again, allowed them to pay out because the standards are so low. Even in the US, when it's 5% instead of 3%, uh, it's still ridiculous. And it's by counting numbers and all kinds of weights and, and, and models that you shouldn't trust and all kinds of things. So I'll talk about stress test in a second. They tell you that everything's OK. If they're viable banks, they can raise equity. Anybody can at appropriate prices. They just don't want to. They just don't want to. They have to be told, you know what, too bad. The only reason you can even live like that is because people believe you can't fail. That's why people give you money. Go to equity investors and see what they'll give you. If you can't, if you tell me you can't at all, have anybody give you a dollar or a euro for your shares, I got to worry about your so I got to worry you might be a zombie bank. And Citi could be one of those. Citi was brought back to life multiple times uh, from um, over the last however many years. There's a, an institution that's truly uh, problematic for you. And some claim it and Bank of America, the ones that made the stupidest uh, acquisitions and lost a lot of money, uh, became insolvent and are only alive today because of all the supports. So Basel has lots of uh, flaws. This regulation is not, is not a good regulation. They learned a few lessons, but not enough. And uh, they have other, there is a lot of bad policies around banking. They always kick the can down the road, especially in Europe right now. They'll say, oh, you know, we can't let any bank fail. We're just going to wave. We're going to support them this way and support them that way and hope they make a loan. But it's the weakness of the banks that's actually harming the economy. And it's delaying the recognition of losses that already happen. It's having too big a bloated a system that is filled with unhealthy banks. That's really what's harming. When they say, if you make me uh, safe, I, you know, lending will suffer, they f forget that lending suffered when they were unhealthy. That's when lending really suffers. So all the narratives are flawed. Um, the confusions in this space are mind-boggling. If you were to start reading about what's going on, about the things I'm talking about, you wouldn't even know that this is under discussion. Because the word is not equity. They use the word capital. And then they attach to it the word hold capital or set aside. And then, so they'll say the banks have to hold 3% equity. Well, companies don't hold their equity. Other investors give them money, and they use it. They hold assets. They invest in things. The whole set aside makes it sound as if the debate is about some kind of rainy day fund, money that you put in a reserve. That's not what we're talking about. That 3 and 5% is just kind of equity funding that's plentiful for corporations out there and that most corporations use, and no problem in the Silicon Valley. Nobody borrows so much. Uh, and so they confuse the debate with incredible nonsense. You know, Every dollar of, of capital is a dollar not put in the economy, set in a vault somewhere. That's not down payment, it's in the house. That's not equity, it's in the assets. That's just nonsense. But people don't understand the word capital, and so they think it's on the other side of the balance sheet, on the cash reserves. So that's the beginning. We're not even on the right side of the balance sheet in the debate. And then other nonsense start. So in a document that sort of, if people don't have time to read the book, we give a list of 23 nonsense claims that are made in this space. There are many, many of them. So 
you start implying false trade of people. And here is a classic lobbyist claim. More equity might increase the stability of banks, might, admits Mr. Ackerman, the CEO of Deutsche Bank for a while, the, the, the Jamie Dimon of Germany for a while. At the same time, it would restrict their ability to make loans. He says that. That's just false. Uh, to the rest of the economy, it reduces growth and has negative impact for all. This, he says, after a crisis in which growth suffered the most since the Great Depression. And not because they had too much equity, but because they had too little. The corrected statement, the edited statement, is if you do, if you have a well-designed capital regulation that requires much more equity, it will increase the stability of banks, and it would enhance their ability to provide credit to lend appropriately, not too much, not too little, make good loans, not any loans. We have lots of bad buildings in China and Spain and Ireland, too much lending. May reduce the growth of subsidized bank, maybe, but maybe it'll be a better size for banks and for the banking system than what we have today. So just uh, that's okay. And the effect on everybody uh, except maybe for bankers would be good. Then they start with other arguments. Some of these arguments other industries make. Oh, well, you can't regulate me here because I can't compete with the other bank in Germany where they don't regulate them, or with the UK or with China. That's like saying, let me pollute the river because the other company is polluting their river. Or your kid might say, let me drink and drive because the other guy kid is allowed to drink and drive. I mean, we don't allow. Uh, we don't volunteer to be harmed, so our banks can win against some other reckless bank somewhere else. The successful banks in Ireland and Iceland did not help their people. Um, then they'll say, oh, but if you regulate us, then the banks will go to the shadow banking system. Oh, into the shadows. That's like saying, don't rule out, don't forbid robbery, because my policeman is only in the lighted streets, but the robbers, alas, go to the dark alleys. Do we accept that or do we give the policeman a flashlight to go and arrest the robber in the dark alley? The shadow banking system is filled with bright sunshine institutions, money market funds, hedge funds. If we want to look there and see what the bank guaranteed to some special purpose vehicle that came back to haunt later on, it's quite visible. It's not in any kind of big shadow. You have to enforce a regulation, just like you have to enforce tax codes. If you say, oh, there'll be a tax escape, then we cancel taxes. I mean, it's, it's, it's a basically an approach that said, I have a shadow banking system because I failed to regulate. Therefore, I shouldn't regulate because I'm so, so bad at it. OK, we can suffer the consequences of not regulating this industry, and good luck to all of us. But if we're going to do it, we might as well do it. So here are the flawed narratives. They're going to tell you that stuff just happens. It was unforeseen. It was a 100-year flood. That's what they wanted to believe. When uh, ben Bernanke talks about it or other policymakers, you'll always hear about how they're helping the economy recover and how they pulled out all the stops to help us when we needed it, just as if there was an earthquake. So that's where they want to start. What they don't want you to think about is how they failed to uh, protect us before that and how they failed to regulate this industry before that. And so that part is a little less convenient for them and certainly for the banks. So if you drive at 90 miles an hour and then you can tell me that, that you know, it was just the fog somehow and that's the what speed you have to drive then, well, you know, we got to deal with that. We got to suffer that. But that's a narrative of a natural disaster. Or the narrative that it was, there was no problem of solvency of sort of too little equity. It was just a plumbing problem. It was just some kind of a liquidity problem. I had the money, but I just didn't go to the ATM. That's a liquidity problem, you know. So they were all really strong, but they just, there was just some kind of a, a, a plumbing problem. They call it a liquidity problem, OK? That's, again, a way to mask their weakness, the structural weakness, is to say, oh, the plumbing broke, uh, instead of saying, you know, my building was really shoddy. And that's why, it, you know, the earthquake, it couldn't withstand any little tremor. Uh, if you talk about safety in banking, the depressing thing is they're going to be the stories, and they keep being the stories. When airplanes crash, we do not accept 
unsafe, flying. And there's only so many narratives that can be said about an airplane crash, except in Malaysia. Um, the black box, or orange, actually, will uh, constrain all the narratives that people can have about whether it was a bird in the engine or the pilot fell asleep or the flight control uh, messed up, if you want to investigate why something happened. In banking, they're going to say, well, you know, they'll tell you some story, they'll have some model, they'll have a narrative which will just allow them to, uh, to not recognize the shoddy construction of this system uh, and the fragility of this system that's entirely unnecessary. Uh, so that's sort of what's going on. Now you'll read in the newspaper that everything is fine because they passed some stress test. If you were to look at that, you would see what a charade this is. The benchmarks are low. The whole approach doesn't really take into account all the contagion mechanisms that we know are there. It asks, if I tell you that there'll be some adverse scenario, give me some model about what you'd lose, and let's see what your balance sheet would look like. Let's not talk about what will really happen in a real scenario and all of that. But in any case, what's the cost of banks retaining their earnings? Money still belongs to the shareholders. If that is paid, no problem. What's the cost to society that they'll be stronger like other companies? Bottom line, we had a major, major financial crisis. It's hard to know what it would take uh, to cause more harm from the financial system to the real economy. And that somehow uh, did not produce effective reform, despite all the talk. And I obviously don't have time to go over that. When they tell you that banks are special, the specialness of banks is what they get away with, is really the bottom line here. Uh, and there's no accountability in the whole system, including the bankers and the regulators and the politician, who always love banks to, for campaign contribution or for telling them what to do with the money, and either are blind or willfully blind to what's going on. So we wrote this book to explain these issues that I tried to pack into uh, however long I took. I never look at the clock. And, uh, and uh, since you're still sitting here, I'll be happy to, uh, to take questions or, uh, you know, on the website, bankersnoclothes.com. Uh, there's lots of links to excerpts and other things, but five bucks for the book. Maybe you'll want to become an expert on banking, too, uh, so you, too, can know uh, that the banking emperors are naked. Thank you. Um, so as I read the book, the thing I kept thinking to myself is, um, why do we put our money in the bank anyway? And if you kind of think about the things they did when they first were formed, and you think about today, it seems like we're at least close to uh, having an alternative for store of value and payment system, right? So that kind of leaves lending. But the question is, as a, as a depositor, if I said, hey, you know what, I'm going to put all my money in Bitcoin, uh, if enough people did that, what would the impact be? Yeah, that's a good question. So you always say, okay, the system is not working. Let's start another system. And uh, I am not, uh, with respect to Bitcoin, I mean, I do think that the payment system is incredibly inefficient. So now when you just talk about their products and how they price them and all of that, there's a whole other set of issues. So are we, you know, is this an efficient system of payment, all the fraud, all of that? I think they're, they're just too comfortable with, with this system. The problem with starting a system is that whenever you have a, a sort of a corporation or an intermediary taking money, you need, you need the regulation, you need policing of that. So you saw even what happened with an exchange of Bitcoin. In other words, you can still have fraud, you can have a co-op bank, and there's still governance problems. So anytime you grow from just, you know, people bartering or people, you know, you have a, a, a control problem. And so the question is sort of the efficient way to organize it. So right now we learned that deposit runs by depositors can be inefficient because depositors just get too nervous and then they want to pull the money out. So we have deposit insurance, but now we didn't at the same time counter you know, the, the sort of the moral hazard, all the problems, incentives that it can create, or the ability to then borrow more and more and more and encumber the balance sheet and all that. So my solution is 
is sort of the speed limits for, 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 for the system. In other words, as opposed to throw it out the window and try to start again, because we're going to go through some of the same growing pain that got us here. It's just that we somehow allowed this system to get to get completely out of control as it got more global and all of that. Or it was fragile in the past too, but for other reasons. Uh, I didn't quite understand this during the crisis period, but I heard that big banks like Goldman Sachs, they insured some of their debt and then they bet against their own debt to fail so they can recover these things. Many of these sounded extremely um, co counterintuitive to me. and in the sense that they were betting against their own interest in many ways to collect money back from the insurers because that drove up, that somehow made sense into their uh, profits and so on. Is there some reason why that was also contributing to things like what led to the uh, banking system failing? I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to, actually. I mean, if you're referring to what's called credit default swaps, what happened with AIG was basically that AIG, financial products, like a subsidiary in London, was selling hundreds of billions of dollars of, of insurance on credit, on mortgage securities, the securities pieces of paper that were backed by mortgages that, you know, suddenly, you know, were rated highly, but then, you know, there was some correlation assumption that was false because they all failed at the same time and all the things that were supposed to be safe. The banks, Goldman in particular, structured those contracts with AIG so that as soon as some rating fell or whatever, AIG had to, like, post cash collaterals ahead of everything else AIG owed. And so the banks were very clever when they designed these contracts, also with municipalities. Look at Detroit and all of that. So they always structure it so that to protect themselves as creditors. And uh, so they, they know very well how to do that. And then what happened was that ended up interfering with AIG's function. And, and even though the government said they won't bail out AIG, then they did. But the key thing to understand about AIG was that the bailout of AIG was a bailout of the banks. So that's how Goldman Sachs got paid in full, and everybody who took credit risk with AIG, because when you buy an insurance company for somebody who can't pay you their insurance, you're taking their, their credit risk by that. But AIG sold insurance, you know, essentially earthquake insurance or other, you know, insurance that they really could not pay, assuming, you know, collect the fees and everything looked great until they had to pay. And then the government had to dig them out. Well, I mean, they all had, you know, they all had interest in doing all of that. And the, 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 the remarkable thing is how it worked for them <laughs> in the end. So you mentioned complexity a few times during your presentation. There was the balance sheet for JP Morgan that apparently nobody understands. There was this diagram of um, in a relationship between different national banks or the, in banks in different countries. That was kind of complicated graph. So if I understand it correctly, this system is so complicated inside the entities like banks and also between entities like banks and other financial institutions that pretty much nobody really understands the whole system. So what's really curious is that we're trying to fix a system with prescriptions of do this, not do that, this kind of regulation, when we actually don't understand the system. So what are the efforts right now to simplify the system so we can actually understand it? And then we can regulate it and come up with prescriptions of how to run it well. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. I think that they, there is, it was clear in the crisis that we really did not understand the system. And that's partly why they said that we need to bring derivative trading into the light, because that's where a lot of risk was hidden. And so supposedly there are regulations to try to reduce the opacity of those markets. And, but there is no way that we really understand that. The reason we say, here's an obvious thing to do, hold their earnings from being paid out because that there's no reason they need to pay them out, is that that's kind of the no-brainer thing to do. The other things about simplifying them, the question is how. So, so they're sort of shining a light on, on the complexity of this system, seeing it a little bit better, which, you know, some attempts are being made when I'm involved in the FDIC Systemic Resolution Advisory Committee. These are the people who are supposed to take a Lehman Brothers or a JP Morgan, in theory, into sort of a failure mode. 
that's Dodd Frank told them to do that, and I'm on an advisory committee. And they tried to do heat maps and things like that and see what's going to happen. And Paul Volcker sits on this committee and says, it's going to be a bailout next time. You know, they're going to all fail at the same time. You can't handle it. You know, how are you going to negotiate losses? When there is a default or failure, everybody runs for cover. And who's going to be left? The attempt here that I'm proposing, of course, is to make sure there's buffers so we are less likely to get there. And so if, should we get near there, there'll be more, there'll be less debt to pay and more people to absorb the losses. But I totally agree with you that the big, big problem of the system is the great opacity and the great complexity. And you might, if you want to be radical, step back and say, you know, maybe we shouldn't have global banks because we can't have bankruptcy codes that jive. We can't. We don't have loss sharing across countries. Legal regimes are all different how they treat bankruptcy. It's long and complicated and convoluted. And if you can't, if you can't fail, then you should, maybe you shouldn't be as you are legally. But that's like a whole kind of warm. I mean, they'll have lots of lobbying about that, telling you that big is beautiful and we love them just as they are. So my understanding here is that your pre main prescription seems to be to, uh, in, to have regulations in place which allow bankers to have more equity, or at least require them to have more equity. But uh, a lot of people, experts in my opinion, say that one of the other main reasons was repeal of provisions of the Glass-Steagall Act, right, which separated investment banking from... So my understanding is that uh, the, the thing that's too big to fail is the commercial side, because that's where people have their deposit insurance, uh, what the money they can't do. And investment banks are actually not, I mean, we can allow them to fail. So with that, like, what is your opinion on that, and how does that, maybe that's easier to bring back versus regulation? No, well, I mean, the answer is, is, is one line. Lehman Brothers was an investment bank. It wasn't fun to let it fail. That's the answer. We now, Goldman Sachs is a bank holding company. I mean, you know, the investment banks were the ones that were the weakest, even though they don't have standard deposits. That's, I alluded, and you may have come late, to the fact that these structural reforms are very, very difficult. Because the way Glass-Steagall died was sort of a, a slow death through through all kinds of ways that they found around it. So Glass-Steagall originally was not about risk, it was more about a consumer protection actually. So it was about uh, having access to depositors to sell them securities. And it might have benefits if you would figure out how to do it, 21st century Glass-Steagall, for governance and for better regulation of the pieces, but it's, Still the case that if you were to do this, which might be beneficial, you still have to worry about the leverage of the investment banks. So in other words, it could be a good thing, but it's not the, sol the only solution, that's for sure. Because systemic can be a hedge fund like LTCM, can be an investment bank, can be an insurance company. In other words, who you're going to end up bailing out doesn't come under easy definition. So to flip it around, uh, you're saying that what you're proposing is a sufficient condition but it's, a, it's necessary no matter what else you do. Got it, OK. So you're not saying it's sufficient, but it will work better with something like The governance problem of the banks. In other words, it's still a problem in terms of the banker and the recklessness, the fines they're paying, all of those things. So I didn't even go there Thank to you. LIBOR or to other things. But. OK, uh, about the um, executive compensations, um, I'm always um, puzzled by two two things or my two understandings. One thing is I think it's um, it's not fair that, you know, they get like tens of millions, you know, in the CEO level, right? Another thing I it's my understanding that this is a free market. You know, they, uh, the company has, they have the free will to select, to, to de determine the compensations. Um, are these two things contradicting or maybe both can be right? Maybe a third, you know, invisible variables somewhere that I don't see? How do you think about it? That's a really good question. I come to banking from, uh, I was not a banking expert. I was studying corporate governance and uh, contracting. And uh, in particular, I was interested in how corporations govern in terms of their equity. The problem in banking is that much of the money, so there is 
sort of how do corporations govern? And so you have, every corporation has this issue. There's compensation committee, there's CEO compensation. People talk about that. What, who determines that, you know, say on pay, all of those things. For banks, what makes it very tricky is that you got a lot of claim holders whose money is invested. In other words, you know, corporations, managers always invest other people's money. The question is what do these people have in return? A debt contract or an equity claim or what? Because banks have so much debt, their shareholders become a little bit conflicted with their creditors or the shareholders benefit from government subsidies because they get to borrow cheaply. So what ends up happening is that at least the shareholders who, who count or you know, their friends, the institutional investors, they don't bother to, to really speak up, uh, are kind of benefiting from this. And at the end of the day, it works for them at the ground level. In other words, the bottom line is, if they all do similar things and if it doesn't work, um, you know, as they say, I be gone, you be gone. I mean, they come back to the industry, they, you know, Everybody who borrowed too much, who took too much risk in this economy suffered except for the bankers who took the risks and the, those who are supposed to keep us safe, uh, basically. So somehow at the, at the accountability at the, at the ground level is not really working. And if you work up the governance chain, you really see the conflicted incentives everywhere on, the, on every level, including even auditors, which was a sort of the, the Enron problem. So it's kind of a depressing note about, you know, how, how governance, uh, you know, works and doesn't. But especially for banks, it works very poorly. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.